So, picture this. You're having a lovely time playing an open world game. You're riding your horse around, or going on an epic journey from one corner of the map to another, fighting bad guys, collecting items, all that good stuff. And then you see it, looming on the horizon like a gigantic middle finger from God, an obligatory open world tower. Yay! The core fun of the open world design ethos has always been about a sense of freedom, of being able to do whatever you want, and go wherever you want at your own pace. But it seems that as open world games have gotten bigger, denser, and absorbed more and more other genres, they've somehow gotten less interesting to explore, and incredibly stifling and bland as a result. A lot of people think that these omnipresent open world towers that you can climb to reveal a part of the world map are basically responsible, and it's hard not to sympathise. Whether you're playing Assassin's Creed, Spider-Man, Shadow of Mordor, Halo Infinite, whatever, they all follow broadly the same pattern. Climb a tower, or a thinly veiled analogue for one, reveal a bunch of cosmetically different copy-pasted objectives, tick them off over and over until you get bored, and just sort of resign yourself to doing the main quest, and basically abandoning the idea of trying to explore. The fact that you basically get told where to go at every turn in these games means that you're not actually invested in the world you're quote-unquote exploring, you're just being given a list of chores that you happen to have to walk between by a big radio tower, or a magic elf crystal, or a robot giraffe. This specific adverse reaction I had to Towers really cemented itself during the lead up to and my first playthrough of Elden Ring, which, before you ask, no, I won't be spoiling. All the footage you're going to see will be of my first five hours, and it won't contain any story stuff or any of the main dungeons, okay? The lands of Elden Ring feel great to explore. Right from the outset, I was striding off on my own, making my own way, finding terrifying adventures wherever I went. Best of all, the game does this without using the dreaded towers or markers to tell you where to go. So, is it just the absence of this stuff that makes Elden Ring's world so fun to explore? Eh, I'm not convinced. While the general criticism of open world towers is warranted, I think the root cause of why so many open world games are bizarrely boring to explore is a little bit more fundamental. In fact, in some of the best open world games ever, towers are used to great effect. In Breath of the Wild, not only does getting to and climbing a tower represent an interesting exploration and platforming challenge, but they're these perfect vantage points to spot an interesting area to explore, and then have a great time gliding all the way there. Horizon's Tall Necks are also a really flavourful way of working what's usually a very stilted, gamey objective into the environment, and they play off the game's movement mechanics excellently. See? Towers can be good! Contrast that with some games that don't have tower-focused design, but do still have bad open worlds, like say, No Man's Sky, Cyberpunk, or Far Cry 5, which even makes fun of the idea of forcing the player to climb towers, whilst making them climb a tower. Anyway, these games are beautiful, and for the most part, have huge, lovingly rendered open worlds, but as a result, they're also incredibly indistinct, with every single area looking like a superficial, featureless desktop background, and having nothing in the way of interesting or memorable topography. Sure, you can explore wherever you want, but you're probably just going to find some more pristine Colorado countryside. Or in the case of 2077, some completely incomprehensible cyber spaghetti designed by MC Escher and not a civic planner. Because these games have worlds that are nice to look at, but weren't actually designed to be explored and understood as physical spaces, players are forced to fall back on quest markers and dotted lines to have any hope of actually getting around without getting completely lost and in doing so, are unable to get invested in the world because they're always interacting with it through the UI. In this context, it kind of makes sense why Towers became such an open world staple in the first place. Look back at Far Cry 3, arguably the game that popularised them just over a decade ago. Its many miles of tropical jungles are essentially interchangeable, and also impossible to navigate without the towers and objective markers basically telling you where to go and what to expect at all times. Look at all these different locations, they're so hard to tell apart that I totally lied about where the footage comes from, these are the real spots I filmed in. Open world towers aren't the cause of games having boring open worlds, they're a quick fix solution that's gradually grown into a game design crutch. You don't have to make an interesting, fun to explore world if players can just rely on map markers and quest trackers to tell them where to go without ever really immersing themselves in the physicality of the game world on anything more than a surface level. This means that although side objectives have no actual wider context of discovery or progress to make them feel meaningful, and as a result, they get boring way faster. So, what's the solution to this problem? How do games make open worlds actually fun to explore? 
Well, I think the first step that so many games miss is just enabling exploration in the first place. If players don't know where to go, then they'll default to chasing after a visible objective and miss out on all the fun of making their own path. That's why it's so important for open worlds to give players a chance to look at the landscape for themselves and then decide where to go, confident that they'll find something interesting. The Batman Arkham games have the genius idea of basically just giving you the ability to fly around whenever you want right from the outset. And from the gliding vantage point, you can easily work out where you're going and what stuff is worth checking out nearby. Both Arkham City and Knight have incredibly densely designed worlds, but because of the way Gotham's architecture uses height differences, colour coding, and distinct locations that are recognisable at a distance, getting around is both fun and surprisingly intuitive. Just boot Arkham City back up and you'll see just how much more you need to refer back to the map when you're in the midlife crisis car compared to just flying around. It's a world of difference. In case the title can't simply let players take off whenever they want though, I find it always helps when games lower the barrier to exploration as much as possible by filling the world with cool, distinct looking locations and then putting interesting stuff there. As much of a cliche as it is, the idea of slapping a mountain, a big tree or, I don't know, a tower on the horizon and letting players decide to go there themselves feels so much better than if there were an objective marker ordering them to do it instead. We can really see the importance of this approach in Metro Exodus which has towers and a fairly typical open world map design for its free roam segments. However, rather than automatically labelling everything on your map once you get to a tower, you have to spot points of interest yourself with binoculars, at which point the game will tell you if there's anything worth finding there with a little crackly noise before marking it on your map. Though, crucially, it never tells you what you're going to find, preserving a sense of mystery and eventually discovery, while also making sure you don't get lost. This tiny change makes exploration feel much more rewarding because it's driven by the player. You're not being told to go somewhere the game reckons you'll enjoy, you're deciding to go somewhere you think is interesting, all the game's doing is verifying you're not wasting your time. All of Elden Ring's main dungeons, for example, are visible from miles away, even if you don't know what they are yet. And all the coolest side stuff is situated within or near big towers, unique looking ruins or giant trees because the devs want you to go to these places, they're the best bits. On that same note, for all their faults, Bethesda games are great at this too. You can't go 30 seconds without something cool and worth checking out popping up on the horizon for you to go and take a look at. And because you weren't explicitly told it was there, the discovery feels all the more rewarding. Additionally, because the map is full of recognisable locations, working out where you are is easy too. Basically all your navigation in Skyrim can be done by working out your location relative to the throat of the world, which is the big central mountain where the Mario Dragon lives. However, this brings me onto an important point. Cast your mind back to the first time you played Skyrim which was, god, 11 years ago, ugh. I'm gonna bet you probably went to explore the Bleak Falls Barrow Dungeon first, even if you could have gone almost anywhere else. Bleak Falls and the cool temple halfway up are literally the first thing you see out of the tutorial, and the big dragon basically begs you to go and have a look and wonder what's inside, even before the main quest that sends you there. On top of giving players the room they need to explore, many great open world games also give players a little bit of a helping hand by nudging them in the direction of the best stuff and ensuring they explore the world in the best order. Breath of the Wild, to go back to that game, does this big time, despite pretending that you can go wherever you want. Look at this poll of which of the four Divine Beasts, the game's main dungeons, players did first. Given that you can explore the entire map from the outset, you'd expect a roughly even distribution, but instead, basically everyone did Valru to the Big Elephant first. Why? Well, it's because that Divine Beast is very near Kakariko Village, the first step on the main quest. So, you might be thinking, players follow the Ghost King's instructions, head to Kakariko, and then the closest Divine Beast. Seems simple enough. Well, yes, but also, for players who don't immediately follow the main quest, which is going to be most people, the entire south of the map is this stealth bottleneck that pushes you eastwards towards Kakariko. North of the Great Plateau is full of scary guardians, west is a bunch of mountainous and desert terrain you have neither the stamina nor the cross-dressing attire to deal with, south is a bunch of tricky to navigate lakes and then the sea, so the only real route is east, which, because of its massive mountains, forces new players either through this path in the wetlands or this path through the Twin Mountains, both routes eventually leading to Kakariko Village and then Zora's Domain. The Zora's Domain Tower is even right there to tempt you to check it out and get hooked onto the easy hand-holdy questline via Prince Sidon. 
because the Elephant Divine Beast is by far the easiest and also contains some important tutorials for stealth and elemental arrows, so the devs would much rather you did it first. You're still making your own decisions, and you still don't know what to expect. The game is just structured in such a way that the path of least resistance is also the most interesting, so that new players don't spend half the game wondering how to make their bags bigger and what all these Korok seeds are for just because they went the wrong direction at the very start of the game. Fallout New Vegas is the masterclass in this kind of world design. At the very start of the game, you're given both an explicit objective to track down the groovy dude who shot you, and also the implicit objective to go to the place the game is named after, Vegas. This is made incredibly easy because the Lucky 38 Casino, the central building in Vegas, is visible from across the map, and Vegas itself is one of the only lit areas in the entire map at night. It's this giant beacon drawing you in wherever you go. But the thing is, this puts the developers in a weird spot. They want players to go to Vegas eventually, that's where the story gets going. But if they simply let players beeline straight there, then people would miss out on a massive chunk of the open world content and might not have the world building and gameplay context to really appreciate it. How could they draw people to Vegas whilst also encouraging them to put it off and go see the sites first? The answer, my friend, is death on six legs. Good Springs, the star town, is actually really quite close to Vegas as the crow flies, and many enterprising players will head north when they leave to get there as soon as possible. However, in doing so, they'll end up running into these terrifying arseholes called Cazadors. Cazadors have deadly poison, hit like sledgehammers, and run in packs. This canyon is even designed to make them impossible to avoid. It's awful. Going northeast instead takes you within proximity of Black Mountain, which is full of aggressive super mutants, as well as this quarry, which is overrun with fucking death claws. Seriously, this tiny sliver of the map between Vegas and Good Springs is one of the hardest areas in the game, and it's right next to the starter town. What this means is that even if players don't want to follow the main quest right away, they've got to take the long way around, which means essentially going on a guided tour of all the best and most important early game quests the game has to offer. Prim and the Mojave Outpost give players a look at what the NCR is all about and why they're struggling. Nipton is a town that gets destroyed, specifically to introduce you to Caesar or Kaiser if you're an Edge Rules Legion. Novak basically hands you a good companion and gives you one of the most fun quests in the game. Walking along the highway here takes you right past Helios 1, which is a great quest, and a trading post where Veronica, your lead into the Brotherhood of Steel lives, then you go right past Hoover Dam, which is what the game's primary conflict is all about. By the time you reach Vegas, not only are you physically prepared to deal with the mid-game, you've also been caught up to speed on the political and ethical conflicts the game is built around. If you'd just run through Cazador Gully to get here, you'd have no idea what's going on with the various power struggles that define the game. But that's just it. You can do that if you want. If you're smart and lucky enough, or just on your second playthrough, you can ignore the introductory route and still get to see some cooler, more advanced content because you've proven you're ready for it. Hidden Valley and Black Mountain are just off the road from Deathclaw Quarry, and beyond Satan's butthole where the Cazadors live is Red Rock where the Great Khans live, two very interesting vaults, and Jacobstown, the super mutant enclave. Oh, and by the way, if you go to Vegas instantly, the game literally lets you skip the big quest where you hunt down Benny because there he is. Far too often, open world games let you go wherever you want from the outset and either scale the challenge to you or simply don't have any challenge at all. By making the world less welcoming and more uneven, it can weirdly imbue the various locations with an important degree of emotional context. Part of the reason why repeated open world objectives get boring is because your relationship to them never changes. Sure, these enemy camps in Halo Infinite are fun at the start when you're struggling to get your bearings, but they just feel like pushovers a few hours in because they're all calibrated such that you could conceivably visit them at any time. To eventually get around to the game in the thumbnail, fixing this problem is what I think Elden Ring excels at, and why it feels like such a breath of fresh air, even if it's actually quite conservative as far as open world design goes. Now, Elden Ring is a huge game and I could point to any number of places where they've done this, but I think the best and minimally spoilery example, because I know what you people are like, is one that I found in maybe the first 20 minutes of gameplay in a place called the Dragon Burnt Ruins. After tactically retreating away from this highly publicised dragon boss who drops out of the sky to surprise you, I went to hide in some perfectly safe nearby ruins. As I explored this area, I bashed my way through some fairly easy zombies, dogs and rats, eventually being rewarded with a <gasps> hidden treasure chest. What a fun, player-driven adventure I wasn't encouraged to go to at all. 
In any other open world video game, this treasure chest would contain some crafting materials, a collectible, or some sort of incremental increase to your existing power. In Elden Ring, however, it contains a big fuck you and the distant sound of Hidetaka Miyazaki laughing at you. Your reward at the end of your little adventure of surviving the dragon, beating these enemies, and finding this hidden cubbyhole is that you get teleported to a very scary brand new area and prevented from leaving until you escape. Fighting your way out of this trap zone basically isn't an option as a starter character. These evil prawns can and will one-shot you, and these miners, quite cleverly, are resistant to physical damage, which is likely all you have access to early on, so they feel much tougher than they actually are. This all means that you've got to run like a little coward baby all the way to this grace with your tail between your legs. Back to the nice, safe overworld. Oh shit. Yup. The game's not done yet. Instead of escaping into the peaceful, melancholy vistas of Limgrave, Elden Ring kicks you out into the middle of a goddamn Bekskinski painting. Just look at this place, it's horrible. It's full of giant versions of enemies you thought were pushovers earlier on, the environment is designed to provoke every single subconscious human threat response, and if you so much as think about stepping into the poo water, you just die. <laughs> you basically just die. Caleb is the monster under Blighttown's bed, and if you've got any sense whatsoever, you're going to want to bounce as soon as possible and never come back. And this is where the true genius of this seemingly cruel trap comes into play. By dumping you into a zone you're just not meant to be in, Elden Ring not only establishes the world as vast, mysterious, and dangerous, and introduces a scary lore concept in the best way possible, it also generates an anecdote. This trap isn't some one-and-done throwaway side quest that stops mattering afterwards. In stumbling onto this encounter, the player forges a permanent connection to the world and creates a mini-story that might not be unique, but certainly feels like it. When you eventually come back to Kaled, you aren't just entering the union-mandated spooky swamp zone, you're returning to a place that beat you before. Or if you choose to stick it out and hard mode slash cheat your way through this really hard area, you get to feel like a rot-tempered monster when you return to the nice green zones and obliterate everything because it's so much easier by comparison. In this sense, the environment takes on a bit of a personality. There's a bit of give and take, action and reaction to your relationship that creates a real-time narrative out of an ultimately static location that's only enhanced by the fact that you might not even have chosen to come here at all. I think this attitude is kind of the reason why good open worlds stand out from bad ones, even if they're tonally and mechanically quite similar. A strong open world, fundamentally, comes down to a sense of confidence, that a player can be let off the leash, allowed to find their own path, and still have have a good time. Even in games that subtly or not so subtly guide the player, they're still more than happy for you to totally ignore the invisible hand of the designers and go your own way. Because regardless of where you choose to go, there'll always be something cool for you to find. In weaker, less successful open worlds, there's almost this sense of neediness to them. Like if you go five seconds without being told when the next scheduled activity is, or where to go next, you'll lose interest. But simultaneously, them being unwilling to limit you in any way, in case that scares you off. It's very easy to boil open world games down to the most obvious individual elements. Hell, that's the reason why people mistakenly focus on towers as being the problem to begin with, and also why gaming executives seem to see the genre as nothing more than a way to smash disparate systems and ideas together. I think, though, that an open world needs to be more than the sum of its parts. Not just a set of dots on a map, but a constantly evolving landscape that you develop your relationship with as you play. Uncovering secrets, planning out routes, and tracing a contiguous line between each of your adventures. If an open world is so bland and textureless that it gives you nothing to grasp onto, then it will be impossible for players to see it as anything other than a pretty backdrop, when it's possible for an open world to be so much more. I guess what I'm saying is that open world devs have been focusing on the open part of their chosen genre so much that they've started to neglect the world. Fuck towers. What we need is more giant caves. When did our nation go astray? When did we abandon the big cave full of giant insects, huh? You can never go wrong with a giant ant, that's all I'm saying. Get on it, you befrauds. Well, fancy meeting you here. In this, the secret after the video segment, which you can only see if you've done my personal quest and are about to get ambushed by the secret boss who's going to jump through your window any second now. Until then, I've got a cool YouTuber for you to check out, and that is Ruby Seals, aka Codex Entry, who you'll probably recognise best for her fantastic series of walkthrough videos on Pathologic, which are absolutely great. She's also got some other really fantastic videos on a whole host of subjects, ranging from the history of Final Fantasy to a spirited defence of some of the worst episodes of Neon Genesis Evangelion, which nearly convinced me they're worth watching. Normally, I've got a little bit of resistance to really long videos, but Ruby's stuff is fantastic and well worth watching if you've got, like, several hours spare. Check them out! Also, 
what kind of after the video segment would this be if I didn't thank my lovely, brilliant patrons, who graciously volunteer access to their wallets for me to buy the things I need to not starve. My patrons are the absolute best, and if you'd like to join them, all you've got to do is go to the link in the description and give me some cash. In return, you'll get early access to stuff, behind the scenes content, and even bonus video game analysis that the plebs don't get to see. Just $1 on Patreon for one month is worth more to me than thousands upon thousands of ad views. It's by far the best way to support the channel. And if you support me for more than $5 a month, you'll also get your name in the credits, like those people you saw on the side of the screen, with $10 patrons getting a very special voice shout out like these wonderful people, who are Andrew Lebrano, Alge, Asaran, Bjorn Carla, Brennan Spalling, Brian Notariani, Constantin Amend, Corey Gerard, Cosmix360, Daniel Metjes, David Setzer, Dirk Jan Karambeld, Dontwo, Diggy Dog, Digletier, Ecton, Edward Franklin Woods, Eugene Bulkin, Gaskell, Greta Hannison, Jacob Dylan Riddle, Janos Fakete, Joey Bruno, Jordan Gear, George Aria Navarro, Lee Berman, Lucas Slack, Mace Window 54, Max Filipov, NWDD, Nate Graff, Patrick Romberg, Pet Pumpkin, Philby the Bilby, Phoenix Thurikaz, Rajagar, Redadex, Regal Regex, Ray's Dad, Sheldon Hearn, Simon Jacobson, Steve Riley, Strateger in Ultima, The Forbidden Shrimp, Tyler Duncan, Whimsical Wisp, Zach Grendel, and ciao. Thank you for watching, I will try and put the next video out faster, they just all end up taking so long. <laughs> wow. Bye.